During the 1990s and 2000s, the British government and security forces showed a select few footballers the truth behind the universe, how the world works, who really controls things, and what it all means. It was an elaborate social experiment to see how the likes of Paul Merson and Jimmy Bullard would react to being presented with such startling revelations. The results were more shocking than any of the MI6 agents and cabinet ministers involved in the trial could believe. Leroy Leiter had a panic attack, Rory Delap broke down in floods of tears, and Lee Catamol soiled himself, though observers noted that it wasn't entirely clear whether that was related to the experiment itself. The most unusual response of all came from Ricardo Baste, though, who, after all of the truths of the universe were revealed to him, simply stated, I know. Of course, they couldn't allow the selected participants to simply go back out into the wider world and step back onto a football pitch with their newfound knowledge and information. You know, in case they uncovered the secrets of the universe to anyone else. Obviously not. That would be mental. Instead, they wiped all of the players' memories of the entire event using a device similar to the Neuralizer from Men in Black. And that, they assumed, would be that. The Premier League and Football League continued unimpeded, the participating players appeared to have been unaffected, and Ricardo Vazte was exiled firstly to Turkey and then to China. He knew too much. How wrong they were, though. As it transpired, there is something unique about the water in Southampton, or perhaps it is just that South Coast breeze, that resulted in some Southampton players being less impacted by the memory loss. And that is where we now find ourselves, in a sick, bitter and twisted world gone wrong, with nefarious forces circling all around us, and entirely dependent on truth-tellers like Matthew Letizia and Ricky Lambert to save us from certain doom. I'm joking, of course, none of that is true, but if I'd have told you it a few years ago, and also told you that Matt Letizia, one of the most universally liked footballers of the Premier League era, and then a permanent fixture on Sky Sports' Gillette Soccer Saturday, would claim that the Vucha massacre in Ukraine was a false flag event carried out by actors, and compare wearing face masks to the Holocaust, would you really have found the first one any more ridiculous? And yet, here we are. And I should stress, despite my jest, that it's not just Southampton players. Former Wales international David Cottrell, Spain legend Iker Casillas, and, admittedly, another former Saints player, Dejan Lovren, have all also got in on the act. Cottrell reckons that Barack Obama is gay, he traffics children, Michelle Obama was born male, and is planning to become America's first transgender president, Casillas isn't entirely convinced that the moon landings were real, and Dejan Lovren came out in the pandemic. No, not like that. His Disney boycott suggests that he might not be too fond of the LGBT community either, but he came out as being anti-vaccine and began promoting posts by David Icke, one of the world's best-known conspiracy theorists, who is famous or infamous for claiming that he is the son of a godhead, whatever that means, that the human mind is manipulated by a spacecraft and interdimensional portal on the moon, and that members of the British royal family are actually shape-shifting lizards. Hey, they're not wrong about everything. If you sling enough mud at the wall, you're bound to get something right. Ike, incidentally, you guessed it, was also a former footballer who played in goal for Hereford United in the third and fourth tiers of English football before injury forced him into retirement at the age of 21. So, just what on earth is going on then? Why are footballers so susceptible to conspiracy theories? Why do Southampton legends manage to make Kanye West appear to be almost reasonable? And why is Britain ruled by a genetically modified human archon hybrid race of reptilian shapeshifters known as the Babylonian Brotherhood, who manipulate events to keep humans in fear so that the archons can feed off the resulting negative energy? All good questions, I'm sure you'd agree. So in today's video, we're going to take a stab at answering them all. Mainly the first one, if I am being entirely honest with you. The lizard people might get less attention, but I will do my best. 
So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to complete and utter insanity as we take a look at conspiracy theories ranging from thinking that you can talk water into tasting nicer to the idea that having a post office within 15 minutes of your front door is equivalent to full-blown Stalinism and both how and why professional footballers have become quite so conspiratorial. Footballers live quite unusual lives. At the elite level at least, most have been within a club or academy setting since childhood and will remain within that setting until their mid to late 30s, and the insular nature of players' lives and dressing rooms inevitably has several knock-on effects. For a start, footballers have a lot of free time on their hands. Typically, players train for about two to four hours a day or, at most, six hours if a manager or coach chooses to put on a double session. Usually, that'll only happen midweek between Tuesday and Thursday when there is no midweek game, meaning players still have time to recover before a match day. That might not sound like a lot, but given the speed and intensity of the game, the sheer number of matches in a season now, and how thick and fast they come during certain periods of the football schedule, anything more would do more harm than good, and clubs should know that given the number of sports scientists that they employ. When things get really busy, in terms of fixtures, players spend even less time on the training ground. It is typical to have the day off after a game for rest and recovery, bearing in mind that it's not uncommon for teams to play two games in a week, and players who are carrying any little niggles, injuries, or showing any signs of burnout are likely to skip sessions. Factor in the match days themselves, in which players do very little training other than gentle warm-ups, but often have an awful lot of travel, and you have a situation where players might have about 16 hours a week or less on the training ground. So what do footballers do when they're not training? Well, naturally, it varies from player to player, and those with families and young children might be more preoccupied during their off time, but it is well established that a lot of players spend an awful lot of time online on devices like laptops, tablets, and most notably their mobile phones. Much of it's spent on social media. This isn't me entering my old man yells at cloud era, my screen time is a disgrace, and I shamefully know what it means to ratio someone, but the link between social media use and increased familiarity and engagement with conspiracy theories is well established, and I think a very credible one at this stage. 15 or 20 years ago, if you thought that birds didn't really exist but were in fact just drones created by a one world government in order to spy on you, or that chemicals in tap water were turning frogs gay, you would be put in some kind of asylum and treated like an outcast. Now you can join Facebook groups with 100,000 other like-minded people telling you that you're a genius. There are entire Twitter communities built around the birds are surveillance tech theory and podcasts which reach millions which will cater to and indeed validate your wildest ideas while adding new layers of insanity to them with every single episode. The amount of spare time that footballers have while traveling or just resting, often spent in front of a screen might seem trivial then, but I think that it is probably the single most important reason why players have become increasingly exposed to conspiracy theories. The biggest spike, for example, in footballers either promoting or at least engaging in increasingly conspiratorial thinking came during the pandemic and particularly during various lockdown periods in which no football was played. Never before have so many footballers had so much free time, without any football to even watch, let alone play in themselves, in which they were sat alone with their thoughts and their phones, doom scrolling on Twitter and getting lost down various YouTube rabbit holes. Hey, look, we've all been there. Some of you might even have got lost down a rabbit hole of watching videos about the history of the offside law. This is by no means unique to footballers, and anyone who was furloughed or otherwise suddenly found themselves with a lot of free time and very little to do during COVID was also at increased risk of becoming consumed by these sorts of things. Retired players, likewise, if they haven't transitioned into any other form of full-time work, have an enormous amount of time on their hands, much of which may be spent on Facebook, which, as we all know, is exclusively the preserve of old people these days. Again, in this respect at least, this is no different to retirees from any other industries. 
I would imagine that every person watching this video who still has a Facebook account, which they periodically check, at least in England, to laugh at someone from their village moaning about a new housing development or the trees being too green, has at least one middle-aged or elderly friend on there who went absolutely off the rails during COVID. I have one, an old family friend, who is a very kind, caring, and seemingly reasonable person in real life, or was at least, but who has been radicalized by their Facebook algorithm into thinking that COVID didn't exist, not that its severity was exaggerated or that it was created in a lab, but that it flat out didn't exist, the term that this community often use is a pandemic. that Bill Gates and Sam Smith Yes, as in, the billionaire founder of Microsoft and the singer are the two most dangerous people in the world working in cahoots with one another, and that, and I must admit, I haven't read up fully on this one, so maybe it's true, though it seems a little far-fetched to me, Oprah Winfrey was behind the 2023 Hawaii wildfires after receiving private approval from Joe Biden and the WHO, which they believe secretly stands for the World Holocaust Organization. Matt Letizia isn't the kind caring and seemingly reasonable in real life family friend that I'm referring to here. I have never met the man though. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he was all of the above, but back on the topic of football, he is almost the perfect example of the profile of ex-player that I'm describing. Before COVID-19, Letizia rarely commented, publicly at least, on anything other than football and sport. And if he had any strong views on anything else, he kept them firmly to himself. In case you think that I'm exaggerating, after the 2017 general election in the United Kingdom, in which the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn unexpectedly grew their vote by almost 10%, but still lost by 262 to 317 seats to the Conservatives overall in a hung parliament, Letizia tweeted, and I quote, my understanding of politics is so bad, does this mean he's our Prime Minister now? For the most part, whenever Letizia tweeted about politics, if you could even call it that, it was quite literally just to tell other people, quote, don't mix sports and politics. As late as September 2019, months before the outbreak of COVID-19 in the UK, Letizia tweeted, quote, I'd rather go to Fratton Park than do a tweet about politics. End quote. For any viewers who may be less familiar with English football, Fratton Park is the home ground of Portsmouth, and Portsmouth are the bitter rivals of Southampton, where Letizia is a legend, having spent his entire professional career. Even at the start of the pandemic, Letizia appeared to be his usual self, and didn't seem to have adopted any, shall we just say, slightly more left-filled views. In April 2020, a few weeks into the first and the strictest UK COVID-19 lockdown, Letizia tweeted, quote, Things you notice in lockdown. 1. Grass grows quick. 2. My wife cleans a lot. 3. Jogging has become something to look forward to. End quote. A week later, he commented, So three more weeks of lockdown. That's three more weeks without hairdressers, nail salons, beauty salons, this is gonna get ugly. End quote. This was the kind of jovial lockdown era tweeting that you saw a lot of at the time, particularly, and I mean this in an endearing way, from men around Letizia's age. It was during the following month, May 2020, that Letizia's posting took a distinct turn and at a truly extraordinary pace. On May 4th, Letizia shared an article from the Times which argued that full lockdowns may no longer be a proportionate response to the scale of the crisis posed by COVID-19. Whether you agree with that or not, it was fairly light and legitimate lockdown skepticism and Letizia personally captioned the article when sharing a screenshot of it, quote, worth a read, and for the avoidance of doubt, no, I'm not making light of the virus, and I have huge sympathy to anyone who's lost a loved one to COVID-19. End quote. By May 14th, a mere 10 days later, he was tweeting full fact to ask if Anthony Fauci had given Bill Gates immunity against lawsuits relating to COVID-19 vaccines in America, and by the following month, He'd started dipping his toes into climate denial, sharing tweets questioning whether climate scientists were scaremongering with their models much as he felt that epidemiologists and pandemic modelers were doing. 
I mean, blimey. Latisse certainly never accelerated that quickly during his playing days. Before the month was done, Letizia had even launched his own investigation into when McDonald's were going to bring back sausage and egg McMuffins. Actually, I'm not sure if that one was a conspiracy, or he just really likes McMuffins. This is what we might call Letizia's transitional era, where you could never quite be sure if he was just asking his followers questions like a friendly uncle, which is how he used Twitter prior to that point, or whether he was questioning the existence of sausage and of eggs, or suggesting that Bill Gates was using McMuffins as a bioweapon, which is, by and large, how he's used Twitter from that point on. This is the problem with conspiracy theories. They can tell wacky but often very simple stories, which feed into a broader worldview, and while it is very easy to fall deeper and deeper into them, for a variety of reasons, ranging from fear or embarrassment to simple confirmation bias, it can be much more difficult to find a way out. And so, since his rapid descent into the world of conspiracies, Letizia has only grown more and more out there in terms of the ideas that he posits, shares, and either appears or outright states that he believes. Within six months of his initial sharing of a very mild lockdown sceptical piece, Letizia compared the wearing of face masks to the Holocaust in a tweet that he later took down. In 2021, Letizia suggested that the cardiac arrest that Christian Eriksson suffered at Euro 2020 in a game between Finland and Denmark was caused by the COVID-19 vaccine, despite the fact that Eriksson wasn't even vaccinated. In 2022, Letizia wrote this with a finger pointing to a tweet that he had quoted from a Twitter user named Unity News Net, which suggested that the Bucha massacre in Ukraine was a hex. That last incident was probably the most damning reputationally for Letizia, who later deleted it and apologised, but was dropped by Southampton from his role as a club ambassador as a result. It is easy to laugh at some of these things because, well, some of them are genuinely funny, but it is quite sad that Letizia, who is arguably Southampton's greatest player of all time, has let a hobby that he developed during COVID, most notably while golf clubs were shut, and I'm not joking when I say that I think that their closure likely had a significant radicalising effect on him, and quite possibly others. I mean, it literally prompted him to describe a conservative government as communists, but that he has let that sully his reputation at a club where he was so beloved and nicknamed Le God, I think is quite sad. I also don't think, despite having some very unhinged and potentially dangerous views, that Letizia is necessarily a bad person. Or at least, what I would deem to be a bad person, if that term isn't too nebulous and subjective. What I mean by that is that I think Letizia's conspiracism comes from a good and deeply held, if daft and potentially dangerous place. Basically, I think that he believes everything that he says, and he genuinely believes that by enlightening other people to these things that he thinks he has discovered, he is helping them and spreading the truth. That is distinctly different to another former footballer, albeit a much less talented one, who has previously flirted with conspiracism before flying completely off the rails in recent weeks. Joey Barton has always been a bit of a character. And when I say character, what I mean is arsehole. And when I say a bit of, what I really mean is an absolutely monumental one. Twice convicted of violent crimes and thrice charged with violent conduct by the Football Association, Barton had a glittering career. Thrice winning promotion from the championship and only once getting his arse handed to him by Scott Brown in the old firm Derby, but he is probably best known for stubbing a lit cigar out in youth team player Jason Tandy's eye at Manchester City, which Tandy cited as having ended his prospects of making it as a professional, beating Usman Darbo within an inch of his life, and for downplaying the role that his brother played in the racially motivated murder of 18-year-old Anthony Walker with an ice axe in 2005 describing it as a scrap and lamenting the fact that his brother lost 17 years of his life. I know, I know, he sounds like such a lovely guy, but you're not going to believe this, it turns out that Barton of all people has some quite reactionary and problematic views when it comes to female football pundits. I know, I know, surprising. 
To be clear, when I say reactionary and problematic, I don't just mean that he doesn't think some of them are very good, or even that he doesn't think that women should be allowed to comment or analyse men's football, which would be fairly extreme in of itself. I mean he has started labelling them all as serial killers on Twitter, and branded anyone who doesn't think that female football pundits are, by default, serial killers, as woke and far left. That's not necessarily conspiratorial, though Barton has certainly conspired to ruin any lingering managerial ambitions that he may still have had that weren't already destroyed by sacking at Bristol Rovers, but Barton is no stranger to the world of conspiracies. In 2018, he described having, quote, incredible conversations about JFK conspiracies with a colleague at Fleetwood Town, and once again, during the pandemic, presumably with a lot of free time on his hands, Barton showed a now infamous video of a business owner in Liverpool refusing to close a soft play centre during lockdown, citing Article 61 of the Magna Carta, a security clause which was written into the Charter to give the Council of Barons the right to rebel against King John were he to break any of its other rights. The Magna Carta was created during the 13th century, over 800 years ago, and not only are only four of its 63 clauses still valid today, Article 61 never even made it into statute law during the 1200s, let alone in the 2020s. Nonetheless, somehow it became a staple of conspiracy theorists during the pandemic, seemingly Barton included. That may well have been because Barton is an idiot, I would urge you all not to underestimate the extent to which that is the case, but that's not the only reason for the former Burnley man's most recent pivot. Barton has recently launched a podcast which has received quite a striking lack of interest and in followers, given the extraordinary extent to which he has publicly humiliated himself in order to promote it. He is clearly desperate for attention, and now the whole management thing has gone down the drain, clearly with not many television opportunities having been offered to him. They are all occupied by, uh, um, just let me check my notes. Oh yes, yeah, uh, serial killers. I suppose, Barton has turned to the most reliable revenue stream of all in the crumbling empire that is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's right, grifting. Make no mistake, that's what Barton is doing. I've no doubt that he is genuinely a bigot, but even he doesn't believe half of the things that he's saying in a desperate bid for attention, which is evidenced by just how inauthentic they are. Barton keeps importing talking points and culture wars from the American author James A. Lindsay, who he has retweeted on multiple occasions. Lindsay is renowned for spreading right-wing conspiracy theories, including cultural Marxism, which is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, which plays upon the same tropes deployed by the Nazis, who called it cultural Bolshevism, and a whole series of LGBT grooming conspiracies, which are most likely responsible for Barton's recent switcheroo to just randomly attacking trans people, which is the most common grift of them all. Barton would no doubt deny that he is a grifter, just as he has denied, any suggestion that he might be far right. Both denials would be somewhat undermined by the fact that the podcast which he is desperately trying, and seemingly failing to promote, appears to be co-hosted with a woman called Pearl Davis, who often goes by the name Just Pearly Things Online. Davis previously embraced the nickname the female Andrew Tate, I know, after gaining some notoriety within the so-called red pill community online, but like Barton, evidently doesn't believe or even necessarily understand almost anything that she says. Also like Barton, she just isn't very good at grifting. Despite having almost 2 million subscribers on YouTube, owing to her initial infamy, Davis's most recent video has fewer than 6,000 views at the time of this recording, the one before that fewer than 20,000, and her hour-long discussion with Barton just 35,000. For context, I once got 70,000 views, so double that amount, on a video about why so many corners hit the first man, and over 300,000 views for a half-hour documentary about West Bromwich Albion. And that was without calling any female football pundits serial killers, or soiling myself on Piers Morgan Uncensored in a desperate bid for attention. It ain't much, but quite literally, unlike Barton and Davis, it is honest work. 
As for the charge of being far right, well, there are some people, perhaps legitimately, who feel that is banded about too easily these days. Davis, however, posted a since-deleted video on Twitter in June 2023 called Why Can't We Talk About The Jews, which featured iconic lines such as I'm not saying that Hitler was a good guy, and now there's all these conspiracy theories, and the more they talk, I think maybe they are right. In dedication to her friend Nick Fuentes, a neo-Nazi Holocaust denier, who Davis denies is a racist, despite Fuentes self-identifying as a racist. In fairness, these people tend not to be a fan of self-ID, so, at least on some things, they are vaguely consistent. And then, in between Barton and Leticia, you have a character like Ricky Lambert, who I don't think is grifting and probably stands to gain very little from his interest in even wackier and more incoherent conspiracies than either of those other two, like the idea that complementing water makes it cleaner and taste nicer, while slagging it off will make it dirty and taste horrible, but is nonetheless mixing with some extremely unsavoury characters and promoting ideas which are, well, also rather unsavoury. Lambert has used his social media to call for doctors and nurses who administered the COVID-19 vaccine to be arrested and to share posts claiming that the vaccine contains cancer virus. Not only is that obviously not true, cancer isn't even a virus. Lambert's conspiracism also has a significantly North American bent, most likely due to his relationship with infamous Canadian racist and conspiracy theorist Chris Skye, who joined him last year at a rally in Liverpool. Having become a bit of a laughingstock in Canada, Sky seemingly has his eyes set on the United Kingdom, and his relationship with Lambert illustrates yet another problem that footballers face in regard to conspiracies. Footballers tend to have high profiles, owing to the sport's popularity and their success on the pitch, and that makes them ideal targets for conspiracy theorists, who can then use them as propaganda tools and as recruiting agents for their grifts and ideas. Admittedly, they haven't quite recruited an A-lister from the world of football just yet, they are lagging some way behind Scientology when it comes to getting big-name celebrities on board. No offence to Ricky Lambert, but... He is not quite Tom Cruise, but it is likely another factor in footballers' vulnerabilities. We also ought not overlook the fact that football in of itself, internally, can be extremely conspiratorial. Managers like to engender a spirit of us against the world, creating a distinct in-group and caricatures of everyone else as the enemy. The often ludicrous idea, therefore, that referees, authorities, and various other figures are all out to get you, which is almost always bogus, has become increasingly prevalent, to the point where it sometimes seems as though managers have begun to believe their own lies. I covered that aspect of football's conspiracism in much more detail in a video exploring football's cult-like tendencies, should any of you be interested. There is, however, also a lot of very justified suspicion of supposed authority figures in football. Elite-level footballers become highly paid celebrities at a very young age, often with little formal education, having had to focus on football from an early age, and typically from modest or humble beginnings, with little knowledge of the world they are stepping into. As their profile and earnings increase, they are surrounded by vultures. Whether it be agents, the media, unscrupulous financial advisors, or their own clubs, before long, young players are likely to have been screwed over by someone, if not multiple people or institutions, that they had previously placed trust in. We know that mistrust in authority, something which can be very healthy when channeled in the right way, can also be a key ingredient in people falling down less healthy conspiratorial rabbit holes. Facts are in the fads that run rife within dressing rooms, and the fact that, within the four walls of a training ground, players often tend to be talking about and taking interest in the same things, and it doesn't take much for conspiracism to set in. Of course, in some instances, it will be fairly harmless, but as we've already established, there will be some for whom it becomes all-consuming. The desire to improve and the willingness to do almost anything to try and gain any kind of an edge often leads players to weird and wonderful dietary, nutritional, and exercise-related fads. 
They tend to be fleeting, thrown out as soon as a new fad is introduced, but they can also undermine confidence in the advice of team doctors and qualified physiotherapists in a way that has been problematic, even just from a fitness and health perspective, for players at some clubs. Effectively though, it also acts as a gateway to other forms of pseudoscience. The psychology of footballers, and elite level athletes more broadly, also has an inherent vulnerability to exceptionalism. It is very useful in football to have a certain level of supreme arrogance. Managers and sports psychologists understand this very well. If you can make an average championship player feel like a top Premier League player, they are unlikely to actually become a top Premier League player, but that belief may well turn them, even if only temporarily, into a very good championship player. Players themselves talk very openly about this. In Netflix's recent World Cup documentary, Kylian Mbappe alluded to the fact that even if he isn't as good as Messi or Ronaldo were, he has to believe that he is, otherwise he definitely won't ever be as good as them. It's a bit like what Gen Z girls call manifesting, or so I'm told, I don't have TikTok. That supreme arrogance, whilst very useful in football though, can be very dangerous outside of it. It's one of the reasons why elite level athletes routinely manage to go bankrupt either during their careers or not long after retiring. They have either been convinced by people around them, constantly telling them that they're special, better than everyone else, and waiting for them hand on foot, or by themselves for sporting purposes, that they are actually special. Of course, they may well be special when it comes to crossing a ball or dribbling past five players, but that doesn't necessarily translate, or indeed, possibly even have any correlation with their ability to succeed as a fashion designer, restaurateur, or the vast array of other businesses that players assume that they can enter and success will inevitably follow due to the sheer force of their own brilliance. It's a similar story, I think at least, that we sometimes see played out in the so-called marketplace of ideas. If you believe that you're somehow special or better than everyone else, and you have some harebrained idea or come across some mad conspiracy theory that fits neatly into your preconceived worldview, it's very easy to believe that you must be right and everyone else is wrong, and very difficult for people who you believe to be inferior to you to convince you that you might be wrong or have taken things just a little bit too far. To be clear, and I want to draw a clear distinction here, I'm not saying that footballers are stupid. That is a very pervasive idea, and a very easy explanation for why some of them might be more vulnerable to believing silly things, but at least anecdotally, having spoken at length with a lot of footballers from a variety of backgrounds, that's not my own experience. Don't get me wrong, there have been some. I won't mention any names there, but by and large, most of the players that I've talked to have been relatively thoughtful, rational, and considered. I don't even think there is necessarily, and I very much doubt the necessary research has been done here, any clear evidence that footballers are any more conspiratorial than the general public at large. If you don't exist within the circles where these kinds of views are commonly held, or at least discussed, it can be very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that they are extremely fringe. In reality, loads of people believe a whole variety of what you might consider to be very out there ideas. Over 1 in 10 people in the UK think that the US government were involved in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, and that figure rises to more than 4 out of every 10 people in Turkey, and 35% in Mexico. Over 1 in 10 Brits also believe that the harmful side effects of the COVID vaccines have been deliberately kept secret from the public, and that is among the lowest figures anywhere in the world. It is over 50% in some countries. And almost 1 in 10 believe that a secret group of Satan-worshipping paedophiles have taken control of parts of the US government and mainstream US media, better known as the QAnon conspiracy theory, rising to 17% in the United States and, bizarrely, over 30% in India, Nigeria and South Africa. It's also important to draw a clear distinction around what we mean by conspiracy theories. The magic of most conspiracy theories is their simplicity, but also the fact that, as Naomi Klein covered extensively in her most recent book Doppelganger, the problems that conspiracy theorists identify and latch onto are often very real and legitimate grievances, otherwise they wouldn't be effective, 
It is the explanations and solutions that they posit, which tend to be facile at best and deeply dangerous at worst. Anti-Semitism, and specifically the idea that Jewish wealth and power is the source of social injustice, if not all of society's ills, for example, which is among the world's oldest and most pervasive conspiracy theories, was often referred to in the late 1800s as the socialism of fools because it often struck upon a lot of the same grievances when it came to inequality and exploitation as socialist thinkers and ideas, it just erroneously blamed them all on Jews. Similarly, it's much simpler and more comforting to believe that Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, Anthony Fauci, George Soros, and Joe Biden are the sole source of 99% of all of the world's ills, and that if we could just get rid of five or six people, everything would be sunshine and rainbows. It is a lot less comforting, satisfying, and easy to explain to people that the economic, social, and political systems that dictate all of our lives are the cause of most perceived ills. The fact that the Labour Party and Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, or the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States, have historically pursued very similar foreign policy goals, for instance, has less to do with the individuals who happen to lead those parties at any given time, or any shadowy puppet masters controlling them behind the scenes, and more to do, for the most part, with the way in which those four parties are set up, the political incentives which govern them, and the military and media industrial complexes which exert control over them. You could argue that they are, in of themselves, shadowy puppet masters, but often, they're perfectly transparent in their aims. It's not that there aren't powerful people and organisations in the world that wish, or at least are willing to do you harm then, they're just not nearly as mysterious or fanciful as a lot of conspiracy theorists would have you believe. We have spent the last few years in the United Kingdom, though much of the world has been in a similar boat, with the governor of the Bank of England, several billionaire or multi-millionaire business owners, and politicians basically stating that they want job insecurity and greater precarity, real-term pay cuts, and even a recession in order to control inflation. That's not a secret conspiracy, it has been very transparently communicated, yet it is much more real, impactful, and likelier to do you harm than a whole host of cooked up crises dreamt up by crackpots without any evidence for YouTube channels. This might seem like a bit of a tangent, but whilst most people like simple solutions and explanations, it is human nature, sports people often have a particular need or desire for control and certainty within their lives, preventing them from having to think too hard about things or be overcome with any doubt, and instead creating a more palatable or satisfying illusion, which allows them to concentrate more single-mindedly on their careers. That, of course, is one of the great ironies of some of the wildest conspiracy theorists. Skepticism is very healthy, and it is through skepticism that wrongs are righted, cover-ups are exposed, and great scientific discoveries can be made. If no one questioned the official narrative of supposed authority figures, it would still be accepted that smoking is good for you, the Earth is the centre of the universe, or, to borrow an example from the world of football, Liverpool fans were responsible for the Hillsborough disaster. There are, as with Hillsborough, real conspiracies, and it is good and proper that people should scrutinise all kinds of things, and if they don't add up, posit well evidence and researched alternative theories. That isn't what a great many conspiracy theorists actually do, though. Many of the best-known conspiracy theorists are some of the least sceptical people imaginable. They formulate a narrative or worldview, often a very narrow one, and then make everything else adjust to it neatly, often with zero interest in evidence, research, or scientific method. Far from being sceptical, then, they are among the most sure of themselves and unjustifiably arrogant people on Earth. I digress slightly, but that's just a pet peeve of mine. As for the TLDR then, I don't think that we can say with any certainty that footballers are more conspiratorial than the general public, we're just more likely to know about it when they are, but it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case, even if only a little, due to various factors such as the amount of spare time that they have, 
often travelling and spent online and on social media, which is only heightened in retirement, the insular nature and mentality that exists within dressing rooms, the distrust in authority figures that being a footballer often justifiably engenders, along with bogus fads that lend credence to various forms of pseudoscience, and the usefulness of supreme arrogance among athletes within sports, which can prove to be a little bit less useful and sometimes rather dangerous in any other field, where they might not necessarily be as skilled or capable as they are in the sport that they most likely have both an natural gift for and have spent a lifetime hyper-specialising to perform well at. Or, you know, maybe that's just what they want you to think. Is football even real? Is anything anymore? I'm beginning to doubt whether you even watch this video or if this is all just a dream. Well, just in case it isn't, you should probably hit the like button and subscribe to this and my second channel, Alfie Potts Harmer, both of which should appear on your screen soon. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. As I say, hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments and you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s should you wish to do so. And all of those links plus a whole lot more should be down in the video description below. Cheers.